Welcome. Welcome in the name of the living Christ, God's grace, mercy, and peace with you all, and also with you. Good morning. Welcome to Barhaven United Church in beautiful Ottawa, Canada. With all the delights of summer, I am so glad that you have chosen to spend some time here with us today. Reverend Carla will be back next week, excited and refreshed. We are all welcome here, regardless of your past, your present, or your future. If you are seeking community and desiring to learn and walk the way of Jesus, you are welcome here. Let us journey together. Let's take a moment now to just center ourselves. As we light the Christ candle, we are reminded that we are part of God and God is part of us. Ever present and ever encouraging us in the way of love, light, and faith. Please join me in the call to worship. So it's Sunday again, and we have made the effort to join in worship. For one, it is not effort at all, such a part of the rhythm of our being. For each of us, it is a time to bring all, all that we are in God's presence. We come to listen, we come to bless, and we come to be blessed. Come. Let us worship God. And as we continue with the opening prayer. Caring teacher, so often we come to you with our questions. Where are you? What should I do? Why me? Other times we put questions in our mouth, assuming your main concern is our moral behavior. We are judgmental. Did we give you enough? loving, nurturing, and at a time challenging God? Your actual questions often surprise us. Freely ask them of us today, for our hearts are open to hear them. Question us, teach us, and guide us as we pray. Amen. Friends, Christ is ever and always alive in this world calling all people to live lives that are new and renewed. We are loved.
As many of you know, I love to tell stories. This isn't the usual children's story. I'd like to call it an ageless story or a wisdom story. The author of this story is unknown and comes from a compilation of sage stories in a book called Wisdom Stories. I begin. Jenny was out shopping with her gran one morning on Main Street. She was feeling a little bored while Gran spent time picking out fruit at the grocery store. Jenny wandered outside and spotted the windows of a large church. She was not impressed, for they looked drab, dull, and very grimy. She said as much to her Gran when her Gran came out of the grocery store. Let's go inside, she said to Jenny. Gran led Jenny into the church and up to the very large stained glass window. Jenny was mesmerized by the magical colors and patterns on the stone floor of the church. They seemed to dance in front of her as the morning sunlight streamed through the immen Im immense window. Look at that, Jenny pointed to the dancing image on the floor. What is it, Gran? Well, her grand replied, actually, that's a saint. See, the window up there, the one that looked really dull from outside, there's a saint up there in the stained glass, and light is shining through her and making pictures dance for us on the floor. A few days later, Jenny's class were talking about a story that the teacher had told. The teacher asked the class what they thought made a saint. Jenny threw up her hand and shouted, a saint is someone the sun shines through, and when that happens, the stones come to life. As we hear the scriptures, two questions arise. What is God's intention? What is our response? As we listen deeply to the reading, as we reflect on what we hear, there will be inspiration. There will be understanding. There will be action. Let us hear the word. The first lesson this morning is from the Hebrew scripture, Genesis 12, 1 through 9. Abraham's journey to Egypt. Now the Lord said to Abraham, go out from your country, your relatives and your father's household to the land that I will show you. Then I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and I will, will make your name great so that you will exemplify divine being. Blessings. I will bless those who bless you, but the ones who treat you lightly I must curse. And all the families of the earth will bless one another by your name. So Abraham left just as the Lord had told him to do and Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old, and he departed from Huron. And Abram took his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they left for the land of Canaan. They entered the land of Canaan, Abram traveled through the land as far as the oak tree of Moreh and Sharon. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants, I will give this land. So Abram built an altar there to see, there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Then he moved from there to the hill country east of Bethel and pitched his tent. With Bethel on the west and Ai on the east, 
There he built an altar to the Lord and worshiped the Lord. Abraham continually journeyed by stages down to Nev. The second lesson is from the Gospel of Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Jesus is tested in the wilderness. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. But he answered, it is written, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, had him stand on the highest point of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and with their hands they will lift you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, once again, it is written, you are not to put the Lord, your God, to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their grandeur. And he said to him, I will give you all these things if you throw yourself to the ground and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, go away, Satan, for it is written, you are to worship the Lord, your God, and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and the angels came and began ministering to his needs. Living God, we listened, we received insight, we will act on what we have heard. Amen. Please join me in prayer. God, once again we come with anxious hearts to seek the sense of your presence. We long to hear your words of truth. God, we yearn to feel your spirit upon us. We are desperate for the peaceful living you call us to. Amen. Now, sharing the land with a herd of cows, you might notice how predictable they are. With 100 acres at their disposal, they wear narrow paths across their favorite watering holes, shady spots, and clover patches. When they want to get from one of those places to another, they line up single file and follow the tracks they had made across the pasture. Some of these tracks are no more than eight inches across, which is about four times the width of a cap. Yet, cows know exactly where to put their feet, even without looking. If you follow those same tracks, when you walk the land, you begin to understand something about why the cows use them. In most cases, the tracks are the shortest point from A to B. Where they do not, it's because the cows have found ways to get where they're going without expending too many calories. In these cases, the tracks avoid both steep climbs and dicey pasture, choosing long stretches under leafy tree lines wherever possible. For us, the most valuable thing about their tracks is that we can see where we're putting our feet, thus avoiding snakes and groundhog holes that exist in the same field. The last thing you want when you're halfway out in the field is to step into a groundhog burrow, which could swallow your leg up to your knee before you even know it. Oh, did I mention ground wasps? They like to make their homes in the tall grass, and wasps are well known for liking their privacy. So we begin to understand the use of narrow paths through unpredictable territory. 
I did the same thing when I drove to and from my home in Pembroke to Deep River, where I worked, taking the time, the same route with the lightest traffic every day, even when that meant I saw the same houses, the same trees and fields every single day. I would take this track so unconsciously that on the days that I meant to go somewhere else first, I would find myself at the front door of the office where I worked, not having stopped to run the errand that I had set out to do. I call it being on autopilot. I'm convinced that this normal human behavior, which means that something extra is needed to override it. Why override it? Because once you leave the cow path, the unpredictable territory is full of life. True, you cannot always see where you're putting your feet. This means you can no longer afford to stay unconscious. You can no longer count on the beat down brown dirt path making all of your choices for you. Leaving the path, you agree to make your own choices for a while. You agree to become aware of each step. You take time turning all of your senses to exactly where you are and exactly what you're doing. When you do this, you hear the buzzing of the, of the ground wasps in time to avoid their front door. You see the gape in the grass across around the groundhog hole in time to step away. You sing old gospel hymns to warn the snakes that you're coming through. They don't want to see you any more than you want to see them. Instead, you see the beautiful thyme-colored mushrooms hiding under the tall, swaying grass and the delicate purple flowering thistle and the subtle smell of chicory as you brush by the plant. Leaving the unknown path turns out to be such an awakening of my senses, such a remedy for my deadening habit of taking the safest, shortest route to wherever I'm going, usually in a big hurry. I decided one day to take the back roads to my office in Deep River from Pembroke. There was a sawmill to the left and a very large pond solidly frozen over the blasts of winter. To my amazement, there was a buck and two does carefully crossing the pond. I can imagine the leaves on the other shore looked very tantalizing. There was a red-tailed hawk perched high on a hollow tree stump, surveying all that was his, looking for his next meal but I'm not allowed to stay on the winding wintry back road. It leads to me right back to the highway. I know. My detour has cost me a whole 10 minutes, a fortune at the pace I ran my day. These are gentle forms of getting lost in the wilderness. I know, but you have to start somewhere. If you don't start choosing to get lost in some fairly low risk ways, then how will you ever manage when one of life's big winds knocks you over, clear off your feet? I'm not speaking literally here, although literally being lost in the windless is a good place to start, since the skills are the same. Managing your panic, marshalling your resources, taking a good look around you to see where you are and what this unexpected development might have in store for you. In my life, I've been lost in the wilderness so many times I can't count. I set out to be healthy and ended up sick. I set out to live in one community and have lived in several. I'm a product of the 50s, where I always dreamt of a little white house, a beautiful garden, and a white picket fence. I set out on a par partnership in a business only to be thrown to the curb. While none of these displacements was pleasant, I will not give a single one of them back. 
I have lived through parts of life that no one in her right mind would ever have willingly chosen. I have decided to stop fighting the prospect of getting lost in the wilderness and engaging it as a spiritual practice. The Bible reminds me that God does some of God's best work with people who truly, seriously are lost in the wilderness. Take Abraham and Sarah, for instance. The Bible gives no reason for God's choice of Abraham and Sarah, except their willingness to get lost in the wilderness. They were not young or spiritual giants. All they had going them for them was the willingness to set off on a divinely inspired trip without a map and only equipped with God's promise. Now that's the end of the Sunday school lesson. But if you follow them all the way to Egypt and back, you get the kind of details that mark genuine wilderness time. Abraham passes his wife Sarah off as his sister at least twice to avoid getting hurt by powerful men who found her attractive. Abraham had terrible dreams in which God showed him the suffering that would come upon his descendants. Sarah got so tired of Abraham asking her if she was pregnant that she sent him to sleep with her maid, Hagar. By the time Sarah had her own baby, Hagar's son was big enough to pose a threat. So Sarah banished Hagar and her boy from the camp, sending him into the desert to die. And that is another lost in the wilderness story for another time. None of this would have happened if Abraham and Sarah had just thanked God for the interesting travel arrangements and said no. They would just stay home in Ur. But they said yes and consented to being lost in the wilderness. Long after Abraham and Sarah, their descendants ended up in Egypt again. The cow path these descendants followed led straight from their slave huts to mud pots where they made bricks. They always knew where their next meal came from. They never had to worry about what they were going to eat. They never had to worry about what they were going to do tomorrow. Their bondage to Pharaoh was the cost of security. Pharaoh was happy with their work but not with the birth rate. When Pharaoh ordered the Hebrew boys killed, God's ears rang with a wailing cry, and he chose Moses, who narrowly escaped being one of those dead babies himself, to lead the people out of Egypt. The people needed 40 years in the desert to learn the holy art of being lost in the wilderness. By the time they reached their land of milk and honey, they knew how to say thank you and mean it. Elijah got lost in the wilderness while running from Queen Jezebel. Jesus of Nazareth consented to becoming lost in the wilderness to spend 40 days lost in the Judean desert, being tested by everything from wild animals, animals to a scripture quoting Satan. Yes, they are the epic stories, but all you really need is a flat tire to throw you into the wilderness. Has that happened to you? One minute you're happily driving down the road, the next you're sitting at the side of the road alone. Do you panic? Or is this a good time to open the glove compartment and start reading the manual about how to change a tire? You suddenly become very aware of your surroundings. Something has happened. You are truly, seriously lost, even though you know exactly where you are. You are vulnerable at the moment. You carefully maintain safety net has ripped. Sitting in the wilderness brings you in to communion with people you have never met. There are people all over the world that give their eye teeth to be sitting in your wilderness where there were no bombs and no guns being fired. 
If you listen to them, they may be able to convince you that the odds of your survival are very good. Popular religion focuses so hard on spiritual success that most of us do not know the first thing about the spiritual fruits of failure. When we fall ill, lose our jobs, wreck our marriages, or alienate our children, most of us who are ministered to by brave friends can find it hard to shake the shame of getting lost in the wilderness of our lives. And yet, if someone asks us to pinpoint the time in our lives that changed us for the better, a lot of those times would be lost in the wilderness times. When the safety net has split, when the resources are gone, when the way ahead is not clear, sudden exposure can be both frightening and revealing. When you lay flat on your back, unable to move, you realize that you're as low as you can possibly be. You cannot help yourself, but you live. I found myself laid low with a black injury several years ago. The miracle of that time was that the people, other people took care of me when I could not care for myself. And the second miracle was, miracle was that I felt safe. My back hurt like hell. I was on drugs that caused dreams I could never even imagine. I feared that I might never return to who I had once been. Yet, as badly frightened as I was, I was also held. I was lost in the wilderness. In this case, the practice of getting lost in the wilderness consent consisted of consenting to be lost since I had no other choice. Now, my father-in-law, in the final years of his life, suffered from dementia and was placed in the manor about six kilometers from the house he had built and lived in his whole life. He escaped from the manor one early evening when no one was watching and went to the bus stop. When the bus stopped, Grandpa Eddie looked up into the bus and told the bus driver that he didn't have any money but he just wanted to go home. The bus driver said, get in, Eddie, I'll take you home. He dropped Dad off at the corner of the street where he'd lived for over 50 years and later called the house to be sure he had walked safely from the bus corner to the front door. God was driving the bus that day. Sometimes you have to see God in the neighbor, the bus driver, or the friend. Dad was lost in the wilderness and found his way home with the help of God, the bus driver. The best way to grow empathy for those who are lost is to know what it means to be lost yourself. However you choose to do it, the practice of getting lost in the wilderness is both valuable and undervalued. In our culture, the idea is to get from point A to point B as quickly as possible, missing all of the territory in between, mostly because you're doing at least five other things while you're in transit, like talking on your cell phone, hands-free, of course, listening to the radio, drinking a double-double from the local Tim Hortons, checking out text messages and telling the dog to get in the back seat and checking the rearview mirror to see how lovely your sunglasses look. Once you become lost, even everything that, except the dog and the cell phone suddenly become unimportant. The phone so you can call some to come, to, to come and find you, and the dog to keep you company. If you're not able to set priorities any other way, then getting lost in the wilderness may be the kick in the pants that you've been waiting for. You had better do it quickly, though, because getting lost in the wilderness business is getting more and more difficult now that we have GPS systems and smartwatches. You will think of other ways to get lost or to accept that you really are lost already through no choice of your own. It can happen anywhere in all kinds of ways. You can get lost on your way home. 
You can get lost looking for love. You can get lost between jobs. You can get lost looking for God. However it happens, take heart. Others before you have found their way in the wilderness where there are as many angels as there are wild beasts and plenty of other lost people too. However it happens, you could do worse than kneeling down, asking a blessing, and giving thanks for the many times you have been lost in the wilderness and God has taken your hand. The image of Jesus lost in the wilderness has a message for us today. Let us share our time, talent, and offering in the hopes of helping others in their wild wilderness experience. Will you join me in the offertory prayer? Generous and giving God, we give thanks for the many blessings and answered prayers we have. And we respond with humble gratitude as we reach out beyond ourselves. May what we have to share each blessings and answered prayers for someone else. And now it comes time for the prayers of the people. Please join me. Gracious and loving God, we come to you in prayer and lay our hearts before you. We admit to our own short-sightedness, but you know that already. God, lead us through the wilderness so that we can find solace in your way. Be our cloud by day and light by night. And when we reach the other side, we'll look back and all we'll see is your goodness. Holy One, we pray for those who are in the wilderness now, the ill, the suffering, the oppressed. Include, dear God, the people fighting COVID all around the world. We pray for those affected and displaced by the wildfires in the western provinces and right here in northern Ontario. We pray, Lord, for the people in Europe that are dealing with floods of a magnitude never seen before. We pray also for our fellow travelers of faith, for men and women through the ages, people who had visions and traveled many times through the wilderness. 
so that we might inherit a secure and firm faith. Thank you, God, for this church family here in Barhaven, our children, our youth, and in the larger community of faith that support us. We know with every fiber of our being that you are calling us to be part somehow of your healing, life-giving touch. Lord of life, as we peer across the barrier of miles, languages, and cultures, show your desire to see your will done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray that these words don't end here, but to co continue day by day in our actions. May this prayer through your grace become for us the way we are connected, through your love with all creation. May our prayers transform our lives and all our words and actions be a visible sign of the unending longing of our hearts. We gather our prayers in the one which Jesus taught to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May God open our eyes to the ways of our own wilderness. May God renew the hope within us and remind us of what is right and just. May the gentle signs of God's endearing love be in our hearts and minds always. Go out in this world with the grace of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.